This is Deloitte Ghana. He was a partner and head of financial advisory in Deloitte, Ghana. He has over 12 years big four accounting firm experience in providing advisory services in due diligence reviews, financial modeling, business valuations, restructuring and transaction support. He has worked on engagements in a wide range of sectors including energy, financial services, consumer and infrastructure advisory. He was responsible for leading engagements in corporate finance, transaction services, valuations and modeling in Ghana and West Africa. He was also the Africa Financial Advisory Competency Leader responsible for infrastructure and capital projects, INCP, across Anglophone Africa, overseeing infrastructure advisory projects in West, East and South Africa. He was a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, ACCA, and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, ICAG. He holds a degree in business administration from University of Ghana Business School and a master's degree from University of Cambridge. In Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. So once again, you are welcome to the Light webinar. I've had a lot of questions this year and the questions are varied, quite a number of them but they all center around questions such as, where should I invest my money? Should I invest in dollars? What is haircut? What is market to market valuation? Inflation is at 50%. Should I still keep my investments that's giving me returns of 30 or 40%? Uh, where do I borrow? Is there anything like good debt? And how do I manage my finances? Uh, Christmas is coming. I need to buy hampers. I need to show love to friends and loved ones. How do I manage my finances? Not knowing the year that we are getting into, whether it's going to be tougher or it's going to be uh, smoother. We have all these challenges around us. And it's not just a Ghana situation, but globally, we've had very serious economic conditions arising out of two major developments. One is the sustained effect of COVID-19. And then secondly, is the Russia-Ukraine war and its spillover effect into Africa, including uh, Ghana. So this evening or this afternoon, we have astute panelists to discuss and take us to our maiden webinar on financial management and investment. And the theme for today's webinar is financial management and investment options under the current economic conditions. And I need not uh, elaborate on that because the current economic conditions are such that you don't need to tell it, you don't need to be told, and you can't be here, you feel it. And so given the current economic conditions, you need to understand what to do so that at least, if not at all, you survive it. We expect everyone to thrive, during the seasonal period and prosper in the new year. And hopefully this panel will help us do that. Maybe the plan is for all the panelists to give us a brief presentation, maybe a brief talk 
or their own presentations on uh, selected topics. So we've given all the panelists some topics for them to speak on or do a presentation on. So uh, of course, maybe ladies first. So we have Doris uh, here to go start with uh, family finance planning and avoiding personal debt. So she will speak on that. She'll start with that. And then followed by Mr. Charles Mensah of a financial management consultants of Trust Consult Limited, managing personal finances during the festive season and beyond. Uh, some people uh, don't realize that January, the month of January is more than 30 days <laughs> because you would have spent all your money and you keep waiting and your salary will not be coming as you expect. So how do you manage your personal finances during the festive season and even beyond? And then Paul, will end it with investment options available for individuals and businesses uh, under the current economic conditions. I know uh, there are a lot of questions there too, but we are not just looking at you as individuals, but even as businesses, what are some of the investment options available to you? So without wasting time, you invite Doris Ayati, CEO of Presendo Consult, a financial consultant to take us to Doris Anhiati, CEO of Crescendo Consult Limited. Doris Anhiati is passionate about helping individuals, families, small businesses, and corporates to achieve happiness associated with financial and spiritual liberation. She helps through consulting, financial advisory, and transformational coaching, leadership development, training, and knowledge exchange. She has industry experience doing what she loves. She's a John C. Maxwell certified coach, speaker, and trainer and also holds a professional coaching certification from Coach Masters Academy in Singapore and membership with the International Coaching Federation. She's a fellow chartered banker, holds an MBA in finance, BSc Finance, Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment UK membership, and is a human behavioral types expert DISC consultant. Prior to co-founded Crescendo Consult Limited, a financial advisory, executive coaching and consulting firm, Doris was the country director for ACCA Global and vice president at Data Bank, where she led financial advisory and corporate finance transactions, macroeconomic and equity research, and founded the Goose Pensions business, currently worth over 1 billion Ghana cities. She was on the team of advisors to GOG for the issuance of Ghana's third euro bond, raising $1 billion on the international market in 2014. Thank you very much. Doris, you're welcome. Hello, Doris. Thank you. Thank you very much and here in Accra. I, my connection has been a bit unstable. I, do I take it that this is time for me to share my 10 minutes content? Yes, please go ahead. So it's time for right. you to share. So thank you very much very much I, and if they are not projected um i just want to share a few thoughts around managing your finances during the festive season managing your personal finances during the festive season and beyond and i have just five nuggets that um i want to draw attention to and the first fact is the point that the rules of engagement for personal financial planning and financial management they do not change so the rules of engagement do not change but seasons do. And then the second point that I want to draw attention to is the fact that seasons, they they affect our emotions. When you take the year 2022 festive season in particular, it is unique. I'll share a few thoughts under each one of these five um, 
thematic areas I've been trying to share in the 10 minutes. And then some recommendations that I would like to share with you, starting with the fact that you should take a double dose of whatever treatments, whatever recommendations, whatever the principles of personal financial planning that helps you to be better off. You should double. All the dose, you know how you would um, twice that. So that would be a thousand MJ. Let me quickly get into what I mean when I say that the rules of engagement do not change. You see, we are in this festive season, seasons come and go. But when, you, when it comes to the principles of personal financial planning, they have not changed. I'll touch on just three or four of them. The first one is what we call the time value of money. Essentially, the time value of money is telling you that money in your hand today is worth a whole lot more than money that you will receive tomorrow. Uh, I'm sure some of you are thinking about debt exchange here already. When the money is in your hand or when you have it today, it's worth a lot more than the same nominal value to be given to you in the future. This principle has not changed and you should apply it in the choices of action that you follow during this festive season and beyond. The second financial literacy 101 or principles that should guide you in making sure that you are managing your finances well is what we call risk return they are positively correlated. Whenever you have an investment opportunity before you, whenever you have any deal that is very highly risky, that is when you get very high returns because you are being rewarded for the risk that you are bearing. And therefore, when there is absolutely no risk, don't expect to get significant returns. The third principle is the principle of liquidity and liquidity reward. It's basically saying that when you don't have easy access, the comfort and convenience of dipping your hands in your money as and when you want, you get rewarded for it. And if you choose to keep the money in your pocket so that at will you can use it, you don't get any reward. So if you invest, you don't have access to the money you have invested with an investment bank, for example. And so you get better rewards. If you put your money in a bank account, it's giving you safe custody. Every day, in fact, multiple times hi Dorit your ability to apply. Hello, Doris. Hello, Doris. Yes, so I think your internet is a bit slow. So maybe you move to um, Charles Mensa. So Mr. Charles Mensa, uh, please uh, get ready. You play your video of your profile. Uh, so can you get ready? Am I, am I, am I? Charles Mensa, financial consultant, Trust Consult Limited. Charles Mensa is an experienced chartered management consultant with a wide finance and systems background and has held senior executive positions in various blue chip organizations and the public sector, including Multimedia Broadcasting Limited, Joy FM, National Lottery Authority, Simnet Ghana Limited, Ghana Libya Arab Company, and currently the managing partner of Trust Consult. Charles has over 30 years of experience in implementing management and financial systems for companies in Ghana and the UK. He's a product of the University of Derby and holds an MBA from Manchester Business School. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, UK, and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. Charles is also an alumnus of the Harvard University Executive Program on Driving Government Performance and the Cybersecurity. 
He is currently the board chairman of Simnet Ghana, Riga Alliance Investment Limited, and Seed Limited, and the host of the weekly financial literacy program on Original FM, Kotobia Prachi. Thank you very much. Charles, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Jones, I don't know whether you can share the slides so that I can, I can speak to it, if, if, if it's there, because I, I had uh, Leon uh, submitted it. But be as it may, I can quickly start. OK. Um, I think this uh, season, because my topic is to speak to um, personal finance beyond the festive season. Now, the word Merry Christmas, I emphasized, I highlighted it, and Happy New Year, I also highlighted it. Now, the Christmas itself, uh, go to the second slide, please. Correct. So, you notice that the word Merry and Happy. Merry is basically defined as the act of celebrating and having an enjoyable time. And happy is a feeling you know, showing pressure. So all the 365 days, we're gonna take six days out, out of it to show. Now to celebrate means that you must have money. You can't celebrate when you don't have money. And therefore I would present this uh, slides to show that you don't necessarily have to borrow to celebrate because if you go by the definition of celebration or merry, you must have money. But the emphasis is on enjoyable time. And the other one to them on unhappy, the emphasis is on pleasure, not pressure. So you can't go and do something that will give you pressure instead of pleasure. So out of the 365 days, only six days, you don't want to do something that will have an impact for 2023. And that's where we're going to look at it. So the first core point, if you can go to the second slide, please. The first core point, and I'll do it quickly, is to start from the revenue side or the income that is coming onto your hands. Because with that, then you can plan. Don't start with the expenditure side for this festive occasion. Start with the revenue side. First thing, are you expecting salaries to come in this festive occasion, how much are you expecting? And you got to state that. I mean, take uh, an Excel sheet or paper and then start doing the writing. The next one basically is to do with your trading allowance. Trading allowance, I'm referring to those who are self-employed. So they are trading. So are they paying themselves? So you have to pay yourself some allowance. So how much allowance is coming through this festival occasion that you can use, because that will be part of your revenue side. You go also to the bonus. This is where the company that you may have worked for intend to give you a bonus. So that bonus has to be captured ahead of time, I mean. Any windfall that you expect to come through, you may have also started this a box where you put some money in there. How much are you expecting to get out of that? Because you may have started it largely because of this uh, holiday season, because you plan ahead. Now, if you didn't plan ahead, that color will be zero. And of course, there are some that are liquidating their treasury bills. So if you do have some treasury bills that you plan, you invested solely for the purpose of the holiday expenditure, then you would liquidate it. There are some also who would have invested in insurance products where they will liquidate it by December. So all those ones are your expected revenue for the season. So you've got to have a record of that. Now, if you have any other um, source of income that is coming through to you for, the, for this season, you must also add that or state that or write that. And that will give us the expected revenue that will come into our hands. Then we'll look at the expenditure side. Can you go to the next slide, please? Good. So now that we are settled with the um, revenue side or what is coming onto your hands, the next key point to me or to us is to look at first your household expenses. Household expenses. This occasion, 
what is my normal expenditure and what am I going to do? So you need to have a fair idea. When I say household, it includes your, 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 your prepaid electricity, every other thing that you do normally. So that's what I meant by household expenditure. If I planned to give some gift to your family, your mother, or your in-laws, if you are married, or your friends, maybe they did something you want for you during the year, and you want to give them a gift, have a fair idea on how much you're spending. Don't take it out of the blue. How much you are going to spend. Now, if you do have kids, if you're following person, you do have kids, during this occasion, when you're doing this exercise, please add at least a small percentage of the kids' school fees in January. Because many people have gone ahead and had fun, and in January, they cannot even pay the kids' school fees. And the kids will be waiting for, the, for daddy or parents to go and pay their fees so they will go. So if you don't take care, you miss out. So take cognizance of the kids' school fees, which is supposed to happen in January, add it to your expenditure for the season. The last point on the expenditure side is your household items. Household items. I'm referring to the capital side. Maybe you save towards it. You probably would like to buy television, or you probably would like to buy a, a fridge, or a, a, a rice cooker. Any other thing that you thought of buying, which will last beyond one year, term it as a household item, which is the capital expenditure. So once you've had these two things balanced, then you have to do a total of the revenues that come into your hands. Please go to the next slide. Yes, you have to add up all the revenue that you expect to come into your hands. And then you add all the expenditure side. When you add the expenditure side, the ideal thing to have is to make sure that you can balance. If it's balanced, in other words, the monies that are coming to your hands is the same as the money that are leaving your hands for the festival occasion, including your January expenditure, then you've done what you can clap for yourself. But ideally, if you're able to have excess of your flow that came into your hands over the expenditure, that difference, you can even save it for January. But the ideal thing is to focus and make sure that you have balancing because it's just for six days thin. You don't want to go beyond that. However, if your expenditure totals is higher and more than the monies that are coming to your hands, then you got to check the totals again. It is possible that some of your expenditure lines have to be dropped because you don't want to go and borrow. So you go through the expenditure lines again that I earlier on shared and see what you can drop. And the first thing you should drop is the capital expenditure because if you didn't get fridge today for December, it doesn't matter, you won't die. You can have it next year. If you didn't buy the television set, how have you coped in your past? So you can drop that capital expenditure because you want to balance the situation. And that's what you must focus on. So you've done your revenue, You've done your expenditure. Don't forget, we are looking at six days. And then you are focused on that. You've added your ch children's school fees, if any. The next slide, please go to the next slide for me. Good. The next slide is for you to watch out because now that you have your template ready, which is the two, three slides, the next one is to watch out for the following. And I try to be very, very practical. I said, never borrow to cover any of the expenditures that I listed. Unless there's a delay in the income, income to match. In other words, maybe the bonuses that are going to be paid to you will, will happen in January. So on the basis of that, you can go and borrow because come January, you'll be given your bonus and go straight to go and match that liability, that debt. But if that is expectant, then don't do it. So the condition that I've attached to the borrowing is when we expect income to come the following month, which is January. Another thing that you have to look out for, 
This advert where people say, buy now and pay later, please avoid it. If it is not in that list that you've done, buy now and pay later. In other words, enjoy now and pay later. You are going to deny your future salary. So avoid buy now and pay later. During the six days uh, holiday, as in the Christmas side and the New Year side. You want to avoid surprise guests because ideally everybody who comes to visit, you must be aware. And therefore, because one surprise guest coming, expenditure will happen. And you don't want to incur any unplanned expenditure. So as soon as the surprise guests are in, so we're even about to step up, step out. The next one, there's a likelihood that during this occasion, your friends, your family, they will come to you to come and borrow money from you. They expect you to lend money to them. Please avoid, because they won't pay you back. Rather do gifts. So if the person comes for time, uh, can you lend me 2,000 CDs? You can't, you don't have. So you maybe you may end up just giving him a gift of, oh, I have a small amount here, so 200 CDs. Rather than lending money to the, such a person, because it, it don't pay. It's a practice that I'm sharing. They will never pay. They will give you trouble because they are, probably it's going to use it to have fun. And borrowed money for fun can never be paid. Then there's this thing that happened during festive vacation. That's an unplanned expenditure by all friends calling you to say that they are in town and you see something nice, it is cheap, and then they are grabbing one for you. That's a liability that they've created for you because you didn't plan for that particular expenditure. But here it is that they've incurred on your behalf. An act of shyness, you also don't say anything otherwise. You just collect it. It's a liability that you're going to begin next year with. We don't want you to start next year with such a liability. It's very, very important. So avoid that. So these are the things that you have to watch out for. Let me go to my last slide, please. Oh, I'm, I'm go next. Step. It's okay. I, I missed the last slide. It's okay. It's okay. So this, these are the things that you must uh, really avoid and things that you must do. So first thing is establish the income that is coming onto your hands. Okay, and then the next thing you must establish the expenditure that will go out, and then you must have it balanced. Where it doesn't balance, it means that you must fund it by a loan, and I'm. A, and treating you to avoid the loan. So you go through the expenditure and cut it because you are working backwards. And then you avoid some of these things coming Christmas where people come and visit you on surprise visits. If it's not in, I am not doing it. And then friends buying things on your behalf. If you're able to follow this small principle during these six days, you will start the year right. If not, you will end up borrowing and then you start January with debt. And debt, as we all know, is time bound. It's not activity based. So each time, seconds, two days, three days, then you are looking forward to service that debt. And that gives pressure on you and you are starting the year with pressure. It's our pleasure. So I will entreat you not to borrow for this festival occasion. Once you do that, you'll be able to start right and think right and progress right and do things that will allow you to have a better Christmas next year. Rather than so you sacrifice this year for a better Christmas next year. And I think that that's where I will end my piece, very practical, straight to the point. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Very insightful. Practical and straight to the point as you describe it, and I agree with that 100%. So you don't start a year under pressure, you start with pleasure. And if possible, defer some of the pleasure that you plan for this year to next year. When you match your income against your expenditure and it's not matching, please adjust your expenditure. It is easier to cut down your expenditure than to increase your income. Thank you very much. That was a very insightful one from Mr. Charles Mensah. We'll go back to our previous presentation from 
Madam Doris Akiati. I hope you're ready now. So Charles, uh, there are a few questions that have dropped in at some point. We will uh, put them to you. Um, so okay. while Doris is trying to connect, maybe you can go to Paul. So we'll get Paul's video ready. So Paul, get ready. You're going to play your profile video and then you come in with your presentation. Paul Kofi Mante, Managing Director, EDC Investments Limited. Paul Kofi Mante is currently the Managing Director of EDC Investments Limited, the Assets Management and Wealth Management Business of the Ecoban Group. He currently supervises the management of over 354 million US dollars, approximately 4.6 billion Ghana cities. He has also worked extensively for the UNDP and the Government of Ghana on the Promoting Private Sector Development Program. Beyond work, Paul has authored four books on wealth management and financial literacy, and he is also a sought-after speaker on these subjects on TV and radio stations and several other fora and platforms in several countries. He holds an MBA in Finance from the University of Ghana Business School. He has received training on strategic leadership at the Harvard Extension School, USA. He has also received training on Nimble Leadership at the MIT Sloan Executive Education, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. Thank you very much. Paul, oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Yao. Um, please confirm you can see my screen. Yes, you can see. Um, if you want to put that presentation mode. Sure. Are we good? Yeah, I'll confirm if it's good. Yes, it's good to go. Okay. Great. So I, I have 10 minutes and I'll try to uh, do a, within the 10 minutes on investment options available for individuals and businesses under the current economic conditions. Just a few questions. Did you know that you could have very good academic results and have a good job, but become financially poor? And did you know that most employees cannot survive for three months without a paycheck? So I asked that important question. What is that important question? Uh, if you lost your job today, if you, just a minute, okay, so start video. Thank you. So what is that important question? If you lost your job today, how many months, how many years could you survive without salary? A rich man once said, if you took all the money in the world and divided it equally among everybody, it will soon be back in the same pocket it was before. And Kiyosaki says, money is one form of power, but what is even more powerful is financial education. Money comes and money goes. But if you have the education about how money works, you gain power over it and you can begin building wealth. What are the investment options available that we could look at? There are three areas I want to touch on on the investment options. Number one is investing in financial assets or what do you want to call paper assets? Here we, we're looking at fixed income. Uh, we're looking at equities, collective investment schemes, among others. We could also look at investing in real estate. And then the third one is investing in a business. Or if you want to find an entrepreneur, hence when you talk about investment, we only limit it to the number one, investing in financial asset. But we could also look at two and then three. It's important, uh, like my uh, uh, colleague yeah, uh, Doris mentioned, uh, there is always a relationship between risk and returns so and you will need to keep in mind that when you are getting into an investment, uh, there is that relationship where the returns is very high. The risk could also be potentially high. So what are some of the areas you could invest in? Uh, you could do fixed deposit. And when you're talking about fixed deposit, you're basically talking about putting money in uh, an in, uh, investment for a fixed period, for a fixed rate, normally with the deposit taking companies or licensed deposit taking institutions. So you can talk about the bank savings and loans, microfinance, among others. But don't forget that there is always a relationship between the risk 
and the returns. The banks tend to be safer, uh, followed by the microfinance and then the micro, uh, followed by the savings and loans and the microfinance. You could also invest in government treasury bills and treasury bonds with all of that is happening. Uh, if you want to look at treasury bonds, you, I would advise that you hold on unless you are getting a very good discount on a treasury bond, else uh, you are safer buying your treasury bill. You can do 91 days, you can do 182 days. In this uncertain uh, times, I would recommend that you do strictly the 91 days. Don't even do 182 days. Of course, you could also look at collective investment schemes. And these are mutual funds and unit trusts. These are investments that are done collectively for a number of people. They are basically uh, three types I want to talk about. One is the fixed income and the money market funds. Uh, they are safer. They invest in purely fixed income and the money market or short dated securities. You could also look at equity funds that invest largely in equities and then the balance funds that invest in both equities and then the, the fixed income space. Uh, if you want to look at collective investment schemes at the moment, I will only recommend money market at this moment or until we have clarity on the whole debt exchange program and until it's concluded, what I will recommend strictly will be the money market. But in investing in fixed income securities, you also need to take note that you build up little by little, taking advantage of the power of compounding. The way the power of compounding works is when you make interest and you don't take the interest, the interest makes interest and interest on interest makes interest and your money keeps growing. John D. Rockefeller started working as a clerk earning $3.75 per week. From this amount, he gave up to his church and say 50 cents. It wasn't much, but it was a beginning. But the time he was 50, he was perhaps the richest man in the world. The good book says, this honest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. You don't need super income to take advantage of paper asset. You just need steady income. Uh, look at 50K plus a thousand CDs. I use 18% compounded quarterly. Uh, growing the monthly contribution by 10%. Within 15 years, uh, you have over 2 million. Look at 200K plus 4K. Within 15 years, you're looking at about 8.2 million. Even 10 years, 2.9 million. The second area you could look at is properties, real estate. Anytime you're looking at properties, you need to be clear in your mind whether it, the purpose is for consumption or investment. Consumption means you're going to live in it. Investment means that you want to make money off the property. Properties could be great, but they come with some challenges. Low occupancy, destructive tenant, low rental income, deterioration and refurbishment, among others. If you want to look at properties, you need to look at the location, location, location. You don't get the location right. It could be a complete waste of money. The final area I want to touch on is investing in a business. And this you can do directly by, by investing uh, in a business, or you can do indirectly uh, through a successful, honest entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur who is honest, who is doing well, some of them, you give them some 20K, they can give you a thousand every month, they can give you 2000 every month. And, and it's, it's one way you could also invest directly. Uh, you can look at businesses that are running and ask if you can do it better and, and jump in there. I would want to recommend strongly in these uncertain times that you think about what you can do legally in addition to your eight to five, or even if you are self-employed, what you can do in addition. Of course, you need to avoid conflict of interest. You never use your employer's time to run your side hustle, but if there is something you can do, why not? Um, don't think of some business as beneath you. I was in a party last Saturday a comedian who came to entertain us during the party was a medical doctor. Uh, you know, so it, it's not an issue of uh, I've gone to school, I'm at this level. So this is uh, lower than me. I know another medical doctor who is into photography now. Uh, people do all kinds of things. I would strongly encourage you to think about creative, creating multiple streams of income, multiple streams of income in these times we are in and then the years ahead. Remember Isaiah 60, 11, the Bible says, your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut. 
day or night so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations. Your gates, your multiple streams of income. Salary is the medicine for managing poverty. It does not cure it. Only a business or an investment cures poverty. You got to start investing now because ladies and gentlemen, if you don't find and a way to make your money work for you while you are asleep. You are likely to keep working when you have to sleep. What are some practical, I'm, I'm mindful of my 10 minutes, what are some practical areas you could look at? Investing in mutual funds, unit trust, treasury bills, treasury bonds, uh, fixed deposit. I'm giving you practically areas you could look at in multiple streams of income. Who borrow for rental? You can go into baking, uh, running a restaurant, molding of ice block. All you need is your freezer at home today with water. A car washing bay, healthy food joint. You can start a school, poetry, laundry, uh, a guest house, uh, emceeing, poetry. You can do singing. You can do some comedy on the side. You can start a blog, YouTubing. There is a lady I mentor. I mean, the last time I, I, I had a, a call with her, she was making average about $12,000 a month in YouTubing. You can sell flowers and beautification plants, owning a towing machine, uh, uh, selling diapers, uh, plant farming, barbering, saloon, uh, gardening, uh, event and rentals, uh, owning a photography studio, uh, 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 learning interior decor, freelance editing, uh, photography. These are all areas we could invest in. So I don't want us to limit our our thinking to only financial asset. It is one leg, but there are several areas we could think about. Um, as I conclude, please think of your income as a table. The table with only one leg, when that one leg collapses, the table would collapse. But when you have a table with multiple legs, when that one leg collapses, the table will, is likely to uh, remain standing, even though it may wobble. This is the hard truth. If your salary is your only source of income, you are a step away from poverty. The least you can do is to invest to create an additional source of income. Uh, if you want something that is very straightforward, I would strictly recommend either the 91-day treasury bill or the EDC money market fund. Anything is achievable. Financial independence is possible. Four pictures taken at the same place. This is the city of Dubai. That is the ruler of Dubai. Anything is achievable, financial independence is possible. Of course, those who want to take this knowledge to another level can get copies of my books and read them. David Chilton, the wealthy Baba says, the best time to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago, and the next best time is now. And I say, the best time you should have taken the decision uh, uh, to become financially independent and take uh, taking advantage of the investment options available was 20 years ago, and the next best time is now. Yao, over to you. I've done exactly 10 minutes. You can take over. Excellent, Paul. Thank you very much. That was quite elaborate and insightful. Very much appreciated. So, Paul, you can stay on for just a minute. A uh, question came through, and I just want you to answer. So the question is, when we say money market, uh, what are you referring to when we say money market? So I guess just finish up. Yeah. So money market is basically uh, investments that have maturities of less than a year. So if you did a 91-day treasury bill, it's a money market. If you did a fixed deposit with a bank for three months, it's a money market. Six months, it's a money market. So in, in, in the finance, when we talk about money market, we're basically talking about uh, investment that will normally mature in less than a year or maximum a year. Yeah. Yes, great. And so someone is saying, look, we should not only be looking at financial assets, like you rightly said, you should look at other things. And the direct question to you is cryptocurrency, an option. Definitely, it's an option. I mean, for people who want to take on risk, um, I mean, we've learned lessons. You see the way the city depreciated. Um, <laughs> uh, some bought at 15. They were waiting for it to get to 20 uh, to sell. Uh, now it's around, what, eight? Uh, remember I talked about the risk and returns dynamic. So anything that has volatility, the way the same way you could make huge money overnight, you could also lose money. I don't do cryptocurrency um, because, and it's personal. I would want to, I believe in financial planning. I want to do things that come with some certainty. 
I know what I am likely to be making in two years, in five years, so I can plan my future. But definitely, if you can take on the risk and the volatility, you want to get into cryptos, why not? I mean, I wish you the best. Thank you very much. Uh, so you do uh, cryptocurrency or you will not consider it. So you are good at Samaritan, that's all. You are the little doctor, right? So I also like your table on the things that you can consider doing. And you mentioned barbering. In this era of no haircuts, yes. So those who want to go into bad brain, thank you very much. So we're going to our last uh, speaker for today. Um, I guess Doris, you're ready now. Hi, Doris. Can we hear from you? Okay, so whilst we're waiting for Doris, uh, Charles, I've got quite a number of questions from you, uh, for you coming on the back of what you presented. So the first question for you, Charles, is this. Some of us have very little salaries. We always end up borrowing and paying at the end of the month. So we never have money on us. How do such people treat, <laughs> or how do we even manage in such a situation? Charles. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think uh, the, the, the questioner basically has to sit down and reflect. He's probably doing one job and it's not any enough. So this idea of multiple streams of income that a poor uh, put up there, he has to consider one of them. Because we have 24 hours and we work eight hours. Six hours is spent driving around and another six. Because there are some conversations that have been hanging out with your friends that doesn't bring any value. So think about using some of your time to do other things. You could go into this sort of borrowing for whatever, borrow to go and buy Uber. So when you close from work, you can be doing Uber as you drive along. So that will give you another multiple streams of income. That will help. So don't be dependent solely on one-sided salary. See what other things that you can do. Because these days, nobody works one job. Some, some of us even, uh, uh, preach, preach at churches, and uh, they are invited as they were invited to come preach. And then you are giving some stipend. You go, so you buy petrol. You know, so although, you know, I'm a chartered account over 30 years, I'm still doing other multiple streams of income. And that's how it is, apart from just giving you some ideas that uh, you are still part of the system. You also will earn income. You know, so please look at it carefully. You can even organize young boys to be going to people's houses. To either go and wash it or clean. These days on uh, social media, you can advertise and then you make money. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Charles. Thank you. I think I have a full on question for you, and then we can go back to Doris. So, Doris, please get ready. Uh, uh, also, get your presentation ready. You can uh, start presenting. Uh, so, Charles, uh, the second question for you is this. Uh, so someone says, I should kindly ask you the best approach to resolving a situation where you want to complete a building, avoid paying rent in January, but unfortunately, all sorts of finance seems not to be flowing. So what do you do? This person, he wants to complete his building and avoid paying rent in January, but all his sorts of finance, I'm sure he's using your balance sheet or your income and expenditure account and all his sorts of finances does not seem to be flowing. So under the circumstance, what would you advise such a person? Okay, first and foremost, um, if he's going to borrow to complete the building, what is the repayment schedule that he's going to get from the lender of the money? That repayment schedule should be the same as the rent that he's currently paying. Okay. So you save rent, you are using it to pay the, the, the mortgage or the loan servicing. If he's done that calculation, any institution, because you're using salary to pay, any institution will lend you money. So you should be able to do some calculation because a savings of rent here will be repayment of that. And the only uh, situation will be the three months or four months period that the building will be completed because it's not the same month. It will be completed. So look at it critically. And I think you can take advantage of that. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, participants, keep uh, sending your questions through. At some point, we will unmute you for you to ask 
your question directly, put it directly to the panel. Uh, so, Doris, I guess you can yes. see your way that talk. Welcome right. back. Right. <laughs> thank you. It's good to be back. So, thank you for bearing with me. I believe that I had gone, if I should do a quick run over. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I was talking about the fact that the rules of engagement, they do not change. And I walked us through the key financial planning principles that would apply, whether it's a festive season or whether it's a morning season or times of economic hardship. Please, can we go to the second slide after this one? I went through the rules of engagement, do not and the sub. So I would like to now focus on the season affect our emotions and actions. Typically, when it's the festive season, we are all on cloud nine. And out of excitement, even though the rules of engagement have not changed, we seem to put aside our thinking. Aside our thinking cap works against us. So I would like to say that we are very excited. We've gone to go through 65 days or minors. It's time to be off work. There are many successes that we want to celebrate during this festive season. We should not let that cloud our judgment. It should not cloud our judgment. So my recommendation here is that bridle your emotions, put it in check. Choose wisely what course of action that you follow. Think through the choices that you are making and continue to think long term. By the time we get to 2nd, 3rd January of the year 2023, the festive season will be over. Those that would have time to go um, the extra mile, they'll probably go until the 10th of January. And then the rest of January, it becomes really tough. Also February, we pretend we don't have loved ones. It's around March that we typically tend to recover. And this is a cycle that repeats itself year after year. So please, while we are excited and we are enjoying our kin and family and friends, and we are very happy and we want to give, please make sure that your thinking cap is still on. Think long term. Think about the fact that January and February will come after the New Year's Day. And it's time to looking at options for prices, compare offers before you take action. And this applies to everything. My colleagues have delved into other aspects that I believe are that options available. Around this time, while we're excited and the companies try to lure us or bait us with all kinds of offers, some of us will call for it. also an opportunity for you to save, which means that look out for doable things that are already on your schedule to be purchased and which seem to be in good alignment the time and the items that can acquire them. But don't just buy because oh, this thing was on sale. You don't need it, but it's on sale and there's a steep discount on it, so you pick it. Please go to the next slide for me. And the next thought that I want to share in that next slide is the fact that the demands on us change by the season. And when I talk about demands changing, usually in the month of March, maybe a little bit of exerted, but the rest of the year, nobody expects or requires you to do it. In February, there's Valentine and things like that. But the rest of the year, nobody is expecting you to. But when to this particular season, which we also call the season of giving, there is a responsibility on all of us to give, to share. And sometimes that is where we carry it to the excesses. So let's be thoughtful in the kind of gift that we are giving. There are expectations on you, right? There are demands, but you don't have to buy a whole new property for someone. You don't have to. Means 
you may be able to show little tokens of love that will be appreciated because you thought about the persons involved. I belong to a number of communities where pre Santa is required, it's a requirement. So I would pick different names in different forums and I would have to buy something for them. If I have to buy cars, I bet that I would only be able to buy so many. And so be reasonable in the tokens as the expectations hit you. And then also keep in mind the advertisement base. Can we please go to the next slide? Depending on the culture um, and the family you grew up in, this is a time when you would be expected to maybe go back to the village. You may have to buy the Christmas shopping for a number of families. That's an expectation or a demand on you. And you need to be very mindful in what items that um, you put in the package that you are supplying these families that you have to support. The next thought that I was sharing was the fact that this particular festive season is unique in so many ways. But the part that stands out is the fact that it's about the second year or so since COVID-19 pandemic was, and it's also because this is the year when we had a very rare scenario of a war in this century between Russia and Ukraine, which has affected um, supply, especially of food. We know that COVID hits logistics in general, so there was some simmering inflation, prices going up. And then we have the Russia-Ukraine war, making it, exacerbating it. And then we have a third situation in our own uh, backyard or turf. And you hear the likes of somebody must go, somebody must go. You hear conversations around haircuts and debt exchange and things like that. We have seen a lot of um, play with our CD dollar with people buying and hoarding dollar. And now we created equity shocks for both the CD and the dollar. And our prices on the market are through the roof. Even though some there's a bit of stability now in the CD dollar, exchange rate, the prices are not coming down except for fuel, which lost just a little bit. And so these are the things that make the season unique. And my suggestion is to remind you that you are trying to plan your personal finances during a very unique festive season like we have, which is unusual because it comes with extra tough environment, economic your disposable income, money that you have in hand to be able to spend freely has been affected. The security of your future is not so secure. It's not guaranteed because we have some companies going through difficulties that are going to lay off. Some have already started. There are some that are defaulting on salary payments. And then your investments where you could take some um, generated returns to have a very nice Christmas. It's also being negotiated. Maybe it's not even negotiated, but you try to withdraw and liquidity crunch has hit it. So they say, come back on the 27th, when 25th has already passed. Okay. So let's be mindful of the uniqueness of this season. And this is what drives me to the next slide, that we should take double pill for our painkiller. We should double the dose. When we talk about the fact that to be successful with your financial discipline, you need um, successful with financial planning, you need discipline. And discipline is not a very plain thing. You are going to have to double the amount of self-restraint that you exercise because all the odds are against you. Now, I heard um, Charles talking about income streams. He does multiple things and generates different income streams. I do the same. Um, this is the peak season for one of the sectors that I'm involved in. In addition to financial planning and consulting, um, I also am a coach. I'm a John C. Maxwell certified and international coaching federation coach. So when I coach and I have very nice clients across the world that I can coach from my base here in Accra, and I generate inflows. Sometimes I'm paid in dollars, even if it hits my accounts in CDs. The conversion may have implications. So look out for that recommendation on multiple income streams. What else can you do? 
I'm a poultry farmer as well, which means that we are doing lots and lots of orders of chicken, guinea fowl, turkey, and things like that during this time. It doesn't even require so much of my financial consulting expertise to do that kind of farming business. I have to learn from that space. So by all means, scout for and expand the scope of your um, income streams. And then it comes to out. Before you let money go out, check whether it's really going to give you value. For any time that you part with your inflows, the values don't have to be benefits coming to you directly. Sometimes the value may be benefiting somebody else in their community, but you are making lives better, so it's still worthwhile. The second thought I want you to be mindful of when you spend is the fact that it has positive returns for your health. I'm a champion when it comes to healthy lifestyle. And I like to say that if you want to be very successful with your financial planning, you want to grow your wealth, you need to pay attention to your health. Because if you don't invest in your health, you end up spending money. So during this Christmas, as you're excited and you spend, be mindful that you are spending on things that will not compromise your health in when already your cash flows may be constrained. Can we go to the next slide? So the next slide, which is my final slide, um, this is where I'm recommending that you are paying attention to the choices that you are making and then people. The fact that we don't have okay, we are a community in Africa and Ghana in particular, talk about our hospitality. We meet people we don't know for many drinks, we bring them homes, we do all kinds. And yes, it's important. Don't forget the important role that people play in your life. Sometimes they are contributing your mental sanity, your emotional stability, which boosts your immune system and keeps you healthy. So invest in people. And I'm mindful to say this during the season. Don't be alone. And don't be in trouble. It's that we've been through so much difficulty. We've been through such turbulence. Um, the times have been very challenging. Not everybody has arrived in this festive season in a festive mood. And mm -hmm. it may take extending a little hand of love, being present and mindful of the people in our network, the people around us, in our families, in our communities, in our churches, mosques, wherever we worship. It has been so well with the person. Let me share a little bit of what I have. Let's be kind, exercise empathy. People have been through so much to be here. People are in pain. People are starving. Some people are losing the shelter over their head because they can't afford their rent. So you remain positive that we are going to go out of the challenges that we are in, the challenges that highlight this particular festive season. We will eventually recover. Even if it may take a while, recovery is definitely assured in the future. Remain positive, be present. This week I saw a video of a young woman who was in too much hate to play a little game at a supermarket. When she was compelled, she was in her she's married, she ended up in a lot of that play that was happening in the particular shopping mall. And then she broke down in tears because she was a mother who needed money for the children. But it took a lot of effort from the people doing this. Um, so it was like a game, some cups upside down on the bonnet of a car. We are in so much hurry, hurry that we miss the very opportunities that will bring the additional income streams. We are in so much hurry or we are so distracted that the office that people could extend to us, we don't see and we don't take advantage of them. We are in too much hurry. We are in multiple income streams that we miss the income stream even when it is right in our faces. So I want us to be mindful and remember that 
you pay it forward. That kindness that you're extending today, you don't know tomorrow they would be extending, they will be in a position to extend that same kindness to a family member or somebody dear to you. Um, I think there's a final slide. Please go to the next slide. Yes. So this is where I will end it. Basically, remember and be mindful that the rules of engagement are not going to change. We can go to the second slide. The rules of engagement are not going to change. The time value of money principle still applies and your long-term financial goals are still relevant even during this season. While you're excited and emotionally, you may um, be very open to spending without thinking, put on your thinking cap and remember that January and February are definitely going to be here. Think about the fact that it is your own emotions that are changing and you have control over it. The demands on you are external to you and it's up to you to make the right choices, not driven by your emotions. And then the festive season is a tough one. And so don't try to beat how you celebrated potentially the year 2021 so that you will land very safely in the year 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fully packed. Uh, this one is like uh, fully loaded. Like you ain't go to the fast food, they go fully loaded. So fully loaded. Thank you very much, Doris. She says, be kind, be present, and be positive. And that is the aspect of the soft side. It's not everything about money. You can invest in people, and that will give you monetary returns tomorrow. And in Deloitte. We say purpose beyond profits. Thank you. So we go to the uh, last session, which is the panel discussion. So all the panel members, we are going to put some questions to them. We also allow you to ask them directly the questions you have on your mind. So uh, the panel discussion, I'll start, Doris, with you first, since you just finished. Right. So a few questions for you. So the first one is, given the relatively low salary levels and rising cost of living, is it possible for individuals and families to avoid that? And how can individuals and families manage their affairs without being staggered high debt burden? So can we even avoid that? And if at all we have to borrow, what can we do to avoid being staggered? I despair. Right. Thank you very much. I would like to start with um, a quote from the good book that says that the borrower is servant to the lender. So whenever you borrow, you have free will become the slave and whoever loaned you the money is your slave master. And they've become your master because now they will determine your freedoms. They can restrict what choices you are going to make simply because you took the loan. Is it even possible for us to live without a loan when we have low salaries? Even if you don't have low salaries, inflation has wiped away 50% of your value. My answer is that it's a matter of choice. We are so powerful as, as individuals, sometimes we forget to exercise that power of choice to our benefit. And so, yes, as a, a grown person, I'm presuming that everybody on this call is at least 18 and above. It is your choice to make. And so, yes, you can make that choice that you are not taking alone. Now, how is this possible? This is possible if you are doing what we call living within your means. And that's why we made reference to budget. I had Charles breaking down how you can uh, put your budget together. So I know you get what I mean. If your inflows is up to so much, then the things you are spending on must be equivalent creatively to what you are bringing in. You cannot be spending and living on more than you are able to earn. It's not sustainable. It's absolutely not sustainable. So please watch. And then some people will say, then we'll end up 
eating things that are not healthy. You can be creative in the choices that you make while living within your means. I think gobe has become a very famous and popular dish during this season. So much so that the price of that one is also <laughs> going up. <laughs> Nuts are also very healthy source of protein. And I keep saying we don't pay attention to dry and smoked fish, but it's also very healthy and rich in all sorts of minerals and nutrients. And so you can live within your means. I, I, I am a poultry farmer as well. People may be uh, making fun of you that you didn't buy chicken or you didn't slaughter a goat this Christmas. At the end of the day, the fact that you ate, even if it was interlaced with what we call intermittent fasting, whether for spiritual benefits or for physical health benefits, it's still a laudable thing to do so that, so that you don't have to take a debt. But if push comes to shove and you must take a debt, access a loan facility, my recommendation is that you check whether you are able to change your circumstances after that loan resource has come into your hands to empower you to be able to repay that loan sustainably. I'm talking about a scenario where when you take the loan, you can invest it in a business, you can invest it in some project or venture, which project or venture will generate income income significant enough for you to service that loan and potentially have a little bit left for yourself at profit. I think that is a good and a reasonable grounds on which to access debt. I hope this has it. Yes, yeah, so just to uh, also follow up on that, is there anything like a good debt and a bad debt? Maybe those who've read The Merchant of Veggies, you know the style of money lenders. So if we have to take the debt, is there anything like a good debt which I should go and then a bad debt which I should avoid? So in our professional circles, when you see our reports and it's saying something is a bad, it means that this loan that has been advanced and it doesn't look like the person who the loan will be able to repay. And what we know happens when you are not able to repay that but potentially, your other assets with our next capture you come and capture whatever you have if your your house or something we can learn so to defray some of the um, liability that are people have lost their businesses because they are taking a loan which went bad. Um, we uh, we also have people that have been jailed. Elsewhere, we have declaration of bankruptcy. And I haven't seen that happening much. Um, I know we are activating it for companies to be declared. But, but. Okay. So I think there is drop off. So maybe Charles, just in case you have any comments on what we just discussed. Otherwise, <laughs> we can. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think, yes, um, I would only encourage that as long as is for the acquisition of an asset, something you can hold, something you can feel. So that in the event that you cannot service the debt, at least you can sell that asset to reduce the debt expo uh, expenditure. The other aspect that will encourage also debt is where you are going to use the money to improve your skills, your professional qualification, which will end up enhancing your income and in power. So on a small scale, sometimes people want to go and borrow to go into professional course like ACCA, ICA, people want to go and borrow for it. Trust me, once they are able to do that and they qualify, no matter where they work, the income will be adjusted because the first degree plus professional qualification, the difference in salary can be able to service the debt that you took. So what are you going to use the money for should be your preoccupation not for consumption. If it's for consumption, it means that you end up having a bad debt, like Doris tried to allude to. So from day one, you have a bad debt because you've consumed it. There's nothing to show about it. So I think we should encourage the loan only for something that you can feel, something that will improve your earning capacity tomorrow when it helps. I mean, weekends, I spend weekends in my farm. I, I do degree a lot and I supply to the hotels. And I've been doing it for 20 years. So 
Uh, one might think that, oh, this guy is a chartered accountant. Look, multiple streets, you can't. You have to consider it very important. Great. Thank you very much. I think it's an advice. There are a lot of professionals on this call, uh, so many accountants, lawyers, doctors, and all. You don't just have to go to your consulting room and go to the office. Think about something beyond your regular income stream. Um, so maybe Charles, the last one is when you were talking and then people not buying things that they may not necessarily need, but they think that it's time to take advantage of sales. The Black Friday is gone. We have Christmas sales coming up. So someone just sent a question that he wanted to buy a washing machine last year. It was 2,000 Ghana cities. Today, last year he didn't buy it. Today it's 4,600 Ghana cities. So if he doesn't buy this year, take advantage of the sales or promotion. Next year, it's likely to be 6000 or 7000 So in such situations, and people not budgeting to do a lot of capital expenditure, in fact, you advise about us not doing a lot of capital expenditure. What would you advise under the circumstance? OK, I, I like that particular example of the washing machine. Now, he wanted to buy the washing machine. I suppose there were a source of income to meet that. Maybe he didn't have the whole 2,000, maybe he had 1,005. So during this year, the, the least he could have done was to continue saving towards it and then making a deposit to the company that was doing it. The differentials wouldn't be that much of uh, 2,000. So if you need a capital item, and you, when I say you need it, You've done some calculation. Washing machine on average will cost you the running cost, I mean, electricity and water. If you compare the time that you wash the items, if you go and teach for those two, three hours that you go and teach somewhere or you go and do other jobs, it's higher. Then you can go in because you're going to get a decent income. And therefore, that calculation, that notional calculation should come in to reduce. Uh, the service of the debt. So what is the capital acquisition or the assets going to be used for? It's either going to enhance your income or it's going to reduce your cost. So it's not because you want to buy a washing machine, but what is it going to be used for? And it's high time people do a lot of analysis instead of the impulse buying, instead of a colleague saying that, oh, I have this, this is very nice. Uh, Sony is nice, so I'm, too, I'm going to buy some. No. Do a critical analysis. For all you know, you, you immediately need a service plot instead of a washing machine. Maybe there's a service plot in an area that's going for 6,000 cities. You rather focus on that than get a washing machine. Start washing with your hands. It could be an exercise in itself. Because after all, we're in secondary school, we're washing ourselves. Even in university, we're washing ourselves. <laughs> so let's start. I mean, we take certain things for granted, but let's be practical about it. I'm not saying I don't buy. Buy when you're comfortable. That you will not complain when you come from work that ah, it's all this washing machine that has created a problem for me. Even spouses, people are married. They come when they fight. Not because the other person, partner, had not anything untoward. It's just that that other party might have influenced the purchase of an item which you borrow money to pay for, with the services become a problem. And out of that argument, almost they all the fighting. time, they are fighting because his salary arrived and 40% of that have been used to service the debt and only to come home and say, uh, the spouse says, so this thing, it doesn't work the way I wanted it. So I won't have to buy a new one. So you can imagine the argument. I've faced that situation before. So it hasn't yes. been... Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul will tell you that romance without money is annoying. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I've heard Paul say that so many times. So I guess yeah. romance without money is annoying. <laughs> and that's the situation that becomes annoyance. And then you are always fighting. Uh, so Paul, I've got a number of questions for you. Doris, I've seen you are back online. Sure. I'll come back to you shortly. Um, so Paul... I think the question for you here is foreign currency and then investments. Should we invest in USD? And the people who did the 15 Ghana CD to a dollar transaction, they made money from 
six to fifteen. That's a lot of money. Would you advise US dollar investment? No, I will, I will not advise that um, for good reasons. When you look at um, the depreciation, so we have a problem when we now start considering buying dollars as investment uh, when we don't really need a dollar. When you look at then, and history does not even support uh, just holding the dollar and not investing. Um, you look at the depreciation of the Ghana city from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So let's say the last about nine years, the city has depreciated on average 12.29%. Let me see if I can just share my screen. It would uh, add a lot of value. Um, I know... Yao is on mute, but Charles, confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, I can. Yeah. So look at that. When you look at the uh, depreciation of the Ghana CD, for example, and this is 2013 to 2020, year on year, you will realize that over the period, uh, the depreciation averaged 12.29%. Over the same period, Treasury bill average return was 18%. So if you had to choose between buying treasury bill or buying the dollar and holding it, of course, you will make average of about 12% holding the dollar every year, but you lose 18% if you had bought treasury bill. Uh, so when you compare treasury bill with the dollar, you would have made about 6% on top of the dollar. If It's even more interesting when you look at the last five years. Depreciation has been 6.84%. Uh, compared to treasury bill average of 13.77%. And this is just for the last nine years. Of course, even if you go back to 2000, these are five-year averages from 2000 up to 2015, you would realize that the depreciation average 12.9%, but treasury bill average 17.63%. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the numbers... Uh, would not support just buying dollar and holding the dollar. Um, I would recommend that if you have the, the, the even dollars based on the history, I mean, we don't know what we remember this year, uh, what happened, try to uh, 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 pour some sand in our gallery where people thought that, look, when I'm better off holding dollar. It, some bought at 15. I know people who bought at 13, 14, hoping that it will get to 20. And they will sell and make money. Now the thing is at eight or so, you know. So at this point, what do you do? Uh, you you can easily have a heart attack. So there is no point in just holding the dollar when you don't need the dollar. But it, it it it's a very selfish way of looking at things. I believe that the reason why we got to fourteen was because people who didn't really need the dollars were buying the dollars and holding it. So when you you buy the dollar at ten and it gets to 15, and you are happy that you've made five CD on the dollar. What you forget is that your fuel price has also increased. What you, you forget is that when you go to buy your groceries, the price will also increase because we are heavily import-driven economy. So when we are looking at buying the dollar and holding it as an investment, we end up creating problems for all of us. When diesel got to 23 or 24 and petrol was heading towards 20, it, because... People who didn't need dollars were buying dollars. So one, history does not support, right? I mean, I've even done from 1990 analysis to date. History does not support just buying dollar and holding it. If you have dollars and you are investing the dollars, great. But if you are buying dollars and just holding it, you are better off buying treasury bills than buying the dollar. Number two, it has a, a negative social impact that affects all of us when people who don't need dollars are buying dollars. So that would be my response, Yao. Thank you. A very cogent one. I think I like it and also practical. Um, so Doris, if you can hear us. Doris, can you hear us? Yes, I I think I had typed something, sorry. Okay, good. So I think the, the, the question for you here is this. So given the volatility of the Ghana CD, what would you advise individuals, families who have got some basic expenses, school fees, rent, 
mortgages and others either denominated in USD or pegged to the US dollar? What would you advise <clears throat> these things to as a part? Thank you very much. So uh, what I recommend that families in that situation, including myself and my family, we've been looking in the market and at each time we have a quick family meeting and we agree on the new guiding principles and margin orders. And so you can also do the same with your family. And I make reference to the family because don't take for granted the needs and the contribution of other members within the family. So if you are the income win um, earner or the breadwinner, as we call it, don't think that um, you can just decide because that thing that you are deciding to take off may be the lifeline of a member in your family. Maybe you decide that, oh, inhaler is too expensive, so let me not buy an inhaler. But the person who uses the inhaler really knows when they need it and what difference it makes for them. So engage with all. You may be surprised other members of the family may have ideas that will help you in cutting off those parts of the budget that can comfortably and safely be cut off. So let's start from there. Involve the family, all the people that are impacted by the decisions that you are going to make, including school children. Maybe they can increase the value that they give in return with their performance by choosing to invest a certain amount in them. The second point is to prioritize. You must all agree which expenditure items are the untouchables, the non-negotiables. You must agree to them. The third point is to look at even the priorities to see what can we do? Are there substitutes? Are there alternatives? For example, there are some children in schools that pay dollar denominated uh, or dollar rated school fees, and they are doing the Cambridge system. And there are some that peg their school fees in the city. And I have seen some parents decide to move children to the Cambridge schools that are pricing their fees in Ghana city. I've also seen families that have children going to school far away, move them to very close to home so that now they can literally walk to school and back from school. So it cuts down on the fuel um, expenditure. Families, some families are looking for jobs that are closer to home. And so these are some of the choices that we, we can make. One, sit down and agree on what you are cutting out as a family. Anybody that will be impacted by the cuts should be part of that meeting and it should be free and fair open. Second, come up with a priority, the non-negotiable expenditure items. Number three, are there substitutes for these non-negotiable expenditure items? Those that we can do without, we discuss and we agree that we are no longer doing with that. Um, there are a number of imported food items that some of us like to consume. Their prices have gone up. And now there are local alternatives for snacks, desserts, that the ingredients are sourced right here, um, Banchia Kaklo from cassava that is right from here. There are other um, sweets that are generated from granite, sometimes from gari with some sweetness, et cetera, that are delicious, adule. They are not imported and can begin to look in these areas. And the other thing that you can also consider is reduction, reduction in quantities. Um, there was a time when we were really eating and a lot of us have gained weight in Ghana. Obesity is one of the top killers in Ghana. So as a family, this may be the time for some people to start losing weight. So the portion on your plate may probably be reduced and then you focus on the healthier things on your plate than all the other things that fat. We are used to cooking our food in this part of the, the world. Oil sitting on top. Now that oil that's going to sit on top, people are cooking soup, tossing their vegetables like that, seasoning it and eating it instead of oil fried juice. And so put your minds together. Initially, it won't be easy but eventually your system will adjust and adapt. I hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, thank you. So, and the next question is for you, Paul. 
Um, so before Paul comes in, I've seen people uh, three four have raised their hands. So uh, please get ready. I'll, I'll mute you shortly for you to uh, ask the question, put your question directly to the panelists. So the question for Paul is this. Let me just pick it. Yeah, please come again. Yeah, so I'm just picking the question for you. So someone said the question. So um, the person's question is this, that he's lost about 20%. He suffered about 20% reduction in value of his fixed income. And he, uh, he wants to know when the value will appreciate in value, even to the original position before the valuation. Would you advise that uh, the person takes out or liquidate the investment now or the person waits? So this person has lost uh, income or some value yeah. in his or her income investment. Yeah. So you advise the person to liquidate now or wait for some appreciation to happen? Well, I mean, if nobody is dying, if uh, the person does not really need the money, then they should wait uh, because they, what they have lost is on paper. It's not a realized loss. It's only when you withdraw the money that you realize the loss. And it's important for the person to that this intervention by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission or the directive that it says mark to market uh, is in the interest of the investors because if that had not happened uh, today that uh, bonds are being sold at a discount remember there is always a related price and interest rates uh, let me put the, the the answer in context so the first quarter this year when treasury rates were 12 percent uh, bonds were between uh, 16 and 19, 20 percent, and most of these fixed income funds were doing. Hello, Paul. So I think money to the fund manager to invest to generate returns for you. So the, the, the money does not sit in the bank account, the money is in investment that is running. Now, if you need your money and the fund manager needs to sell some of these bonds to pay you, remember anybody who can buy the bond today, the bond that will be paying a coupon of, let's say, 19%, that person could as well buy treasury directly and get 35%. So the only way it makes sense to get a buyer for this bond is when you sell the bond at a discount or you sell it below the face value. So you bought a bond of a million. Uh, Yao has a million. But y'all can buy that 91-day uh, treasury bill and get 35%. Why would you, do you think y'all will take over your bond of a million and give you a million? That will give y'all 19%. So you may have to end up selling uh, the 1 million for 700,000. So y'all will pay 700,000 and take over the 1 million and get the coupons or the interest and the uh, maturity value. Now, when you sell the, the bond that is for 1 million and 700,000, there is a loss of 300,000. Who pays for that loss of 300,000? If uh, Charles has 700,000, Charles needs 700,000, we are all in a fund. And we go and sell a bond that has a face value of 1 million. We get 700,000 and we give the 700,000 to Charles. Charles walks away with the 700,000, but leaves a loss of 300,000 to the rest of us. So the, 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 the directive says that you cannot do that. You cannot punish the person who is not taking their money because somebody is taking their money. So the mark to market value is the current value of the bonds. In other words, if you are taking your money now, we have to sell the bonds. You take the, your money with the loss as well. So for a number of investment houses, on your statement, you see amortized value and you see the mark to market value. The amortized value, it's more like your principal plus the accrued interest because the underlying securities are running and building up interest. But the mark to market is if we are selling the securities to pay you today, this is what you get. So I would recommend, and this has never happened. I mean, we've been doing this, uh, Doris, my colleague, we've been in this industry for years. I've done this 22 years. This has never happened where treasury bill rates, or not that I have seen, moves from 12% and in another six months or eight months, you're looking at over 30%. You know, so let's wait for the market to correct. When the market corrects, once interest rates start coming down, bond prices will start appreciating. 
and we will all be fine. Uh, remember the day the announcement was made uh, on the staff level agreement on the, uh, with the, the IMF. That was the day the CD started coming down. We believe that when we fully get on the program and there is some discipline in the way we do things, interest rates will come down, bond prices will increase, and we will all be fine. Okay, thank you very much. I think that that that's very helpful. So I think there's so many questions on people's mind. Um, so the thing is, similar to when you buy shares and the value of your shares depreciate and you are selling it, you don't say that you bought it for five Ghana CD and therefore you should be selling it today uh, for five Ghana CD. If you've lost value and it's selling for three Ghana CD, you just sell it for three Ghana CD. So you don't leave the loss with those who have chosen to keep their investment with them. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to allow people to ask questions directly. I'll do ladies first. So Gladys Quay, get ready to ask a question. So Gladys, please go ahead. Uh, let me unmute. Gladys, please unmute and ask a question. So please ask your question, Gladys. Then Esther, Gladys, can you hear us? Please ask your question. Otherwise, Esther, go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Palate. good to yes. see you. This is okay. Esther Teria, Tafo, Tafo. Okay. go ahead. Yes. Okay. So my my question uh, goes to Paul. Uh, with the with the haircut that was announced, if you have a bond uh, that you receive a coupon twice a year and you have received first coupon with a haircut, are you going to be affected with it um, from the look of things? And and my second question also has to do with the T bill. With the way the interest is not stable now, is it advisable to do 91 days, uh, uh, um, I mean, renewable with the interest? Because you see, it, it sometimes it's 31, 32. So if you log in the year, it means that you, you're going to miss out on 2 or 3% in subsequent uh, months if it goes up. So is it advisable to be doing 91 days um, uh, turnover, right? uh, I mean, that do you call it? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Paul, you want to respond to that quickly? Then we go to Derek. Sure, sure, sure. Many thanks. So let me start from the second one, the 91 day treasury bill. It's important for us to understand that even if you give instruction for rollover, it doesn't mean the rate will be maintained. So if you invested in 91 day for uh, at 35 percent, and then you give them instruction that rollover every three months. It doesn't mean that at the three months, you get another 35%. At the point of the rolling over, the prevailing rate is what will apply. So if you did three months and by the time you are rolling over, the rate has increased, you'll get a higher rate. If the rate has reduced, you'll get a lower rate. The reason why I recommended you look towards the 91 days in my presentation is because we're going through some uncertainties as a country. I mean, the exchange is not completed. There is a lot of consultation, a lot of engagements going on. Uh, it is possible uh, that uh, some modifications may happen along the way. Uh, that is why I said, stay short, let's do the 91 days. Uh, so that uh, you 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 have some clarity in your mind when things settle, then you can have long term uh, uh, decisions when you would have to invest. On the first one, on the haircut, whether if you have received uh, one interest and you another interest. So let me try for the benefit of other people on the call. When you buy uh, government bonds, normally interest are paid twice a year. Every six months, you get interest on your government bond that is running. So. If you have received one coupon already, what happens to the other coupon? Uh, per the, the announcement that was made, individual bondholders were exempted. So if you are an individual who is holding a bond, this whole haircut conversation does not apply to you at all. So you, you can sleep sound knowing very well that you get your, your full coupon. Even for the corporate and um, 
institutional invested. Some have accrued in interest that is outstanding. I told you interest is paid twice a year. So for example, if you have been getting your, your interest March and September every year, the last one you received was September. You are expecting the next one March next year. That exchange happens in December. What happens to it? Conversations are going on for accrued interest to be paid. Assuming that if uh, 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 the, the uh, debt exchange is implemented in, in, in its current stage, like I said, a lot of consultations yeah. are going on. So let's keep our calm. I am sure that the maximum in a week time, we would have some clarity on how things are likely to turn, turn out. So uh, my sister who asked the question, if it's for you as an individual, you are exempted from this uh, bond exchange. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so Derek, then Watson, can you ask your question? Derek, are you ready? Otherwise, go to Gladys. Gladys, are you ready now? Okay, let me allow Francis in Chroma. Francis, please unmute and ask your question. Philip Alan Banks. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. All right, my question is to Mr. Paul. Okay, um, let's say I have a investment in mutual fund. And then let's assume my balance is 2000. And I check my balance maybe uh, today. And then I was given a, let's say, actual balance to be 1,000 now, uh, 1,000, uh, 2,000. And then the market value now has been stated to be 1,500. Does that mean if I'm to take my money, I'm going to take the 1,500 or the actual balance, which is the 2,000? Yeah, can I take it? Yeah, please go ahead, Paul. Sure. Yeah, so if, if the amortized value or the investment is 2,000 CDs, but the, the mark to market value is 1,500, what it means is that if you are selling, if you want to take your money out now, you'll get 1,500, you'll get a 2,000. And you know, we're going through a lot of uncertainties with all that is happening, that has changed. Uh, so, uh, 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 I nearly said she can't pay the day, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you when, <laughs> when you have this uh, volatility and uncertainty, it does impact on pricing. So I think that when things settle uh, down, prices will look good. But if you want to take it now, you will walk away with a thousand five hundred. As I explained, when you ask the question about the mark to market, that's right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, Alan, Philip Alambas, last question from you. Okay. Thank you very much. And my question goes to Paul. I would like Paul to uh, give his take on <clears throat> investing in um, international stocks at the moment. I think there are applications available where you can directly invest in companies that are listed on the S&P 500 and all the other platforms. I would like to know his, his take and his advice to somebody who would like to explore this option also. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, uh, Philip Alambas. Sure, um, you, you need to make sure, you, you know in my presentation, I didn't talk about equities and I deliberately did not talk about equities uh, because of two reasons. Number one is the time allocated was so small, 10 minutes. But the other one is a bit, it's a bit sophisticated. It's not straightforward. You need to understand what you are getting into uh, because equities could also be quite volatile. I mean, uh, the same way you could make very good money, you could also lose money. So Philip, if you really understand equities and you want to diversify and look at uh, 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 shares on the international market, why not? Uh, just make sure that you understand what you are getting into. Don't put your money into anything that you do not understand. And don't just jump on board because other people are saying that hey, it, it's good to look towards investing in uh, um, international bonds. Uh, somebody said that if you're going to visit your grandmother in the village and uh, the trotro you sat in, the trotro driver is telling you about a particular share 
uh, the mate is talking about it. When you go to the village, the taxi driver is talking about it. It's, it's possible that the party is over. That is not the time to get in, in, into the party. So let's not just jump on board because there is noise around it. Let's get into the fundamentals and be sure what you are getting into. But definitely it's an option available you could explore. Thank you very much. So I think um, maybe Charles, I'll direct this question to you. Um, and then we will we'll follow up with closing comments from all the panelists. Then we can end. So thank you for all those uh, that you participated, sent questions. We are unable to take all the questions. So Charles, I have a loan with a bank with a balance of 22,000 Ghana cities. But with the current economic crisis, I am, uh, I'm torn in a very difficult situation. I saved 12,000 Ghana cities planning to start a building this month. But with a regular rise in interest rates, I'm confused as to whether to clear half of the loan or post the building project and for the building project or continue building. So he's got a loan. The loan has got a balance of 22 and he's got savings of 12,000. So should he go and pay half of the loan and, and then post his building project or continue his building project, given the current uh, rate of inflation and how price of things are going up, should he still continue with the building project? Um, yeah, 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 go ahead. Hey, Josephine. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Josephine. The project can continue as long as he has a spare income to continue it. Because when you continue the building project, there must be income that you are going to use. And where is the income coming from? So if he doesn't have any income, but yeah, he's going to depend on the loan to continue the building, what is he saving? It's possible that he's going to move into the room. I would have encouraged that, put a building project on hold for now and balance yourself properly because these days the revenue streams has to be worked on. So I encourage him to work on the revenue streams, the ideas that Paul shared, quite a bit, some of them that are easy to enter. So that particular venture, could, he could tell himself or herself that he will use the proceeds, part of the proceeds to do a building project. So the multiple streams, what aspect is for the building project? Else it would cost him more by borrowing to do a building project. And yet you, you haven't even finished the building project. If you look at the situation we are in in the system, the, um, the number of uncompleted houses in Ghana, when we value them, it is huge because people have locked up their capital in uncompleted buildings. So I always tell people rather to do service plots, you just buy it as a form of investment so that tomorrow you can sell. I mean, if you buy four plots, you can sell three, the proceeds can be used and you can raise the building to a level that you can just go and occupy. But just going to borrow and then building it's possible because everybody says you build. Why don't you try a mortgage? Why don't you try a mortgage? A mortgage should be your first attempt. But after all, after a number of years, when your salary improves, you can sell the old house, repay the old mortgage, and then repurchase another one. People, and people are not averting their mind to it. Because if you are single and you bought a two bedroom mortgage, and now your family is large, where you need three, four bedroom, you can sell the first one, redeem the mortgage, and repackage yourself for the next one. So I think I encourage people more or less to go into the mortgage business, get an understanding properly, and go into the mortgage business. They are going to lock up your work in progress in the land. That's what it will take 10 years. By the time you are about to go to a limited level, the plan itself for the community has changed. And then you have to break it and do it again. So it becomes a cycle. So rather invest in service plot to sell. And then when you are ready, like you have, have arrived, where you can build a house within six months, because the cash is there, then you can go in and build. So that way you won't run out of uh, money 
you run out of technology, you run out of plan because your 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 money is there to build. And that's what I will encourage the person to do if you can. Thank you, thank you very much. That's very very helpful. I think there's so many people who have this problem. Uh, so a lot of the uncompleted houses going on there, and people are taking twenty years, ten years, half a period to thirty years to build, and you you cannot understand. Uh, when they started the project, there were, there were nobody there. I mean, even they didn't have light or water by the time they finished the city. So you can see how, how long it took for them to build. So, Paul, maybe you have a, a comment on the housing and then your closing comment, then we can end. Um, and then after which, Doris, you give you the final word, uh, country managing partner. So, sure. Paul, Many thanks to you, yeah. So on, on the building, it's a big issue for a number of people. Uh, but I think that the mistake I almost made with my wife, and I see a number of uh, young people or uh, young professionals making the same mistake, is when we confuse the dream house with the first house. So young professionals want to build their first house, they are building a seven bedroom house. What is the average number of children they have? They have two, maximum three, but they are building a seven bedroom house. And you know what? Whilst they are building that house, they are still paying rent. And, and if you are not a businessman or you are not a CEO and then huge income, you're going to use another 10 to 20 years to build that house, like uh, the, Charles, the point Charles made earlier on. And when you drive towards Ebri, Kasua, Dodua, you see all these uncompleted houses. This is uh, money locked up in bricks and mortar that is not completed. And until the house is completed, you don't have a use for that house until you have completed it. So I would want to encourage, especially young professionals, please don't confuse dream house with the first house. Go in for your three bedroom house. Even people who live in chamber and hall receive visitors and they still find places to sleep. How much more a, a, a three bedroom house? And if you start a house, I would also recommend that you either have a plan in an L shape, T shape or U shape so that you can break the house, you, you can break the building of the house into pieces. If it's an L shape, you can build one part, move in and continue the other part. If you're building a block, a seven bedroom house, you will never finish. But if it's a seven bedroom house that is L shape, you could finish a small part, move in or it's a, a T shape or a U shape. The other point Charles made I want to reiterate is the issue of using mortgage. It is not a first option, but the major difference between paying rent and using a mortgage is this, that anytime you pay rent, that money is gone for good. It will never come back again. It only gives you a temporary place to lay your head. But anytime you are servicing your mortgage, you are owning the property until you have done the last payment. If you are using a mortgage, this is a guidance. Number one, buy a smaller house that could be expanded. Because you go and buy a big house, it, will, it, it can eat you up. You may end up not being able to even pay uh, the entire amount outstanding. So buy a small house, two bedroom house, enough space on the compound that you could expand. Number two, take the mortgage in the currency of your earning. If you are earning CDs, please don't go and take a dollar mortgage. Imagine if you had a dollar mortgage this year, between July and uh, uh, November this year, you by all means have challenges with blood pressure. Because you wake up every day, your balance in cities will keep increasing. You haven't done anything wrong. You don't have control over the currency. So take a mortgage in the currency of your earnings. And maybe the final uh, statement on the housing is that once you take a mortgage, I would want to encourage you seven years to pay off. Once you take a mortgage, don't change your car. Don't change your furniture. Let everything come to a standstill. Anytime you have some small lump sum, go and try to reduce your balance outstanding. And my final comment is that money is everybody's business. Uh, whether you are an accountant, a pilot, a pastor, a teacher, money is everybody's business. Uh, the way we go to school and we hear people are doing major in economics and minor in sociology, everybody must major money because money is everybody's business. Uh, thanks to Deloitte for putting this important program together. Yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't know Paul was an architect to L shape, T shape. So, uh, Doris, I have the last word and then <laughs> can take over. Thank you very much, Yael. 
So um, my final words would be that we should be true to ourselves. And when we should be true to ourselves, talking in terms knowing and understanding yourself, having that level of self-awareness where you know how much you can manage and you cannot uh, manage. And I say this because it forms the basis for the character piece which you need if you are going to be successful in managing your financial affairs. There's going to be peer pressure. There is about if you have reached that stage, you should put that on due pressure. And you raise whatever long term financial prospect that you could uh, potentially achieve. And so be true to yourself. Being true to yourself also says that you have a budget that is guiding you and you are sticking with the budget. You cannot deceive yourself. You may think you are deceiving the people outside, but what about yourself? You have a budget envelope with only 1,000 Ghana CDs coming in, and you are buying, stealing, borrowing, um, doing all sorts of tricks, um, engaging in activities that potentially would be waiting for you later on in your life. And if you don't engage in these things and you are focused on being true, this is who you are, this is how much you earn for now. This is the kind of lifestyle that you are able to sustain. And even when our incomes go up, there is no rule that says that you must definitely adjust your lifestyle so that you are spending more. And I also like to say that while our budgets may be small and we like to keep in it, make room for ambitious actions will help you to potentially expand your budget. You saw my little boy jump into the video there. So let's say your budget is 1,000 Ghana CDs. And when you live within the means of 1,000 Ghana CDs, that means that you might not be able to take a certain MBA program. It means that you might not be able to buy something. But charge yourself. Such that while the budget said expenditure for you to acquire that MBA, for you to have that building where you are not paying rent, for which you won't have anything to show for when the year has ended, be ambitious and say that I'm going to take action on the revenue side. I'm going to put in extra effort. I'm going to undertake some additional income generating ventures or I'm even going to bury my head in learning some new skill that will enable me to earn more so that debt for the next year or in the years ahead will expand outside of the scope of the thousand that you may have started from. Through it all, be positive. Have faith that it will get better. It will get better. Merry Christmas. And close to Deloitte for putting it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Doris. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we have our country managing partner, Mr. Dan, also join us. Um, the review link is there. Please uh, scan it and then send us your review comments. Thank you very much for participating. And then, Mr. Osu, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Yao. Uh, and um, so let me say thank you to you, Doris, uh, Paul, and uh, Charles. Um, uh, for this insightful uh, presentation. Um, yeah, let me tell you something about Charles. So when I finished this form, so that's many years ago, um, he was already qualified. So he's the one who told me um, you have to do accounting. So wow. I owe a lot of uh, uh, gratitude to Charles. Um, wow. Uh, on the wow, wow, wow. <laughs> so, so Charles, yes. Um, the, 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 so the webinar has been very insightful and I've learned a lot. There are a lot of things that have been discussed, but I have just picked three of the things that um, stood out. Um, the first one I'll talk about is always plan for your finances. So that came out quite clearly from the discussions from uh, the panel. 
save, invest first, and then plan accordingly for other expenditures. So don't um, do the expenditures and then you wait um, for your savings. So save first. The second one I picked up is make a conscious effort to get multiple streams of income. So that this one is very, very key. And they said that nobody has ever made it with one stream of income because when that stream of income is cut off, you will be left bankrupt. And, and this is food for thought for everyone on the webinar. By all means, make a conscious effort to find another stream of income. And then the last one I will say is learn to be disciplined when it comes to your finances, because without discipline, you will make a lot of unplanned purchases which will eventually cause you to spend more than you have planned uh, to do. Let me once again thank each and every one of you for your time to join this webinar. And from all of us, the partners and staff of the world, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a very prosperous uh, new year. Once again, uh, thank you. Uh, Doris, Paul, and Charles for your time and also for this insightful discussion. Yeah, let me hand you over back uh, for okay. the... Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so for all those who participated, uh, once you registered, the link will be sent back to you. Uh, it will be available on YouTube, so you can go and refer to it. Uh, slides that are available to us will also be made available to you as well and you'll be given the opportunity to join our webinars in future. Uh, Paul's book are uh, also available. Um, uh, Paul, maybe just a word, where can we find some of your books? Uh, if you can briefly tell us. And then, Paul, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, so um, books are available at the um, Total Web, uh, opposite uh, Top Radio FM. Or uh, there is a total where also I just sent Mount Crest University at Adabraka. Or you can call this number. Uh, I mean, with what is happening in the world today, we do more delivery. People don't have time. So you can call this number and uh, it will be arranged and delivered to you anywhere in Ghana or anywhere in the world. 0544 uh, The gentleman is called Fred. 544 045888. So when you reach out to Fred, he will arrange and get a boost to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please uh, continue with the review. Send them through. We improve our webinars. We'll get the right topics for you. And we thank you for all the feedback that has been sent so far. Um, thank you. And have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. I can believe them on live. You can make that shot. It will come in. Thank you.